Hey there, I'm Eric Metaxas. This is Socrates in the City. Uh, it's a little different from our typical uh, Socrates in the City events. In fact, it's very different. There is really maybe not exactly a typical Socrates in the City event. We've done a number of different kinds of events. The most typical uh, we do in a club, a uh, private club in New York City. But we've done them uh, in, in a number of venues. We've done them in auditoriums. We've done them in Oxford, England at St. Aldate's with a very small uh, crowd. Uh, we've done them uh, in the south of France with John Lennox. Um, but today uh, we're doing something uh, even unlike all of those. Uh, we are in a private home. This is the home and to of Tom and Loveless Howard. Thomas Howard is someone uh, whose books I had the privilege to encounter around 1989, shortly after I had my own conversion uh, to faith. Somebody suggested that I must read this book by Thomas Howard, and I read the book, and it changed my life. That's the uh, short version. The slightly longer version is that I was so taken with what he was saying in the book, Chance or the Dance being the book, uh, that I was astounded. It was um, not just what Thomas Howard was saying in the book, which was itself astounding, uh, but the way he wrote it. It's hard for me not to go on and on about his prose style. It's simply spectacular and unique. Um, but what he writes about, uh, which we will get to in the, in the conversation, I'd never encountered the idea before. Uh, he calls the book Chance or the Dance a critique of, of modern secularism, but it really puts the medieval Christian worldview against uh, the modern secularist idea of the world, but in, in a way that I've never seen before or since. Um, I've reread the book many times, and I'm convinced it's literally one of the best books uh, written uh, in, in the 20th century. If you think that's hyperbole, I'd invite you to read it, and then let's quibble together. But uh, I, uh, I found out that uh, it had gone out of print. It was, uh, for many, many years, published by Ignatius. In fact, the book was written in 1969. I don't know who the original publisher was, but it had gone out of print, and I thought, a book this great cannot go out of print. So we contacted Ignatius and said, will you please put it back uh, in print? Uh, if it helps, I'll write a forward to it. Uh, uh, we'll, I'd love to do a Socrates in the City event with Tom Howard talking about it, anything, so that people can appreciate this book uh, as I've appreciated it. It's, it's just so wonderful. It was, of course, still available on, on Kindle, uh, but um, I was thrilled that Ignatius took me up on my offer uh, and uh, that the book uh, is out in a new edition with a foreword uh, by me. That's the only thing that spoils it, but you don't, who needs to read the foreword? Uh, just read the book. It really is magnificent. It's been my privilege uh, to know Tom since 1998. I met him, uh, I guess it would be, what, that was about nine years after I read the book. I went to uh, Oxford, England for the centenary celebration of uh, C.S. Lewis's birth. The uh, C.S. Lewis uh, Foundation was putting on uh, a two-week-long uh, conference with tremendous speakers. I was at the time working for Chuck Colson, and I, I read the list of speakers, and Peter Kraft was there, and Chuck Colson was speaking, and on and on and on. And lo and behold, Thomas Howard was going to be there. And I thought, this is, to my mind, like meeting John Cheever or Dante. I said, I can't believe I'm going to get to meet the man who has written this absolutely extraordinary book, Chance of the Dance, which changed my life. But I did get to meet him. Um, I write about it in the foreword. Uh, e even meeting him was a glorious moment. It happened uh, happily uh, at, uh, in the quadrangle of Maudlin College, which was C.S. Lewis's college in Oxford. Uh, and it was sunny and beautiful, and it was a wonderful meeting. But then a couple days later, I got to hear Tom talk. I'd never heard him talk before. I'd only read his writing. And he talks as he writes, which is to say gloriously. Uh, he spoke in the Sheldonian Theater, the, one of the most glorious buildings on planet Earth designed by Christopher Wren. And uh, afterward, uh, we got talking and, and we became friends. And uh, I've had the privilege of many, many conversations with him uh, over the years. Uh, sometime, I think around 2002, I had him speak at, at Socrates in the City. We weren't filming them. 
uh, back then, but he spoke on this book, Chance of the Dance, but I thought I really would love to have a conversation with him uh, about that book and about anything. Uh, anything I talk to Tom about, it just, uh, it's hard for me to shut up when I'm talking to somebody as lovable uh, and fascinating as, as Tom Howard, because I can't believe uh, I get to have the conversation with him. So I hope you'll forgive me for that in, in, in advance, because I know myself. But uh, it really is a, it's a treat for me to have been able uh, to be his friend uh, and to get to know him uh, beyond his books. But uh, the reason we're doing this is so that you too uh, can get to know him a little bit and so that you will be, uh, so that your interest will be piqued and you'll want to read uh, his books. Uh, he's famous for a number of books, Christ the Tiger, many people know. Chance of the Dance is certainly my favorite, but there are a number of them. And if I can uh, get uh, Socrates in the City audience uh, interested in reading them, I will be thrilled beyond thrilled. So um, in a couple of minutes, uh, we'll sit down right here uh, in Tom and Lovelace's uh, living room, and we'll begin our conversation, but I'm really grateful uh, for your tuning in. Thank you. Tom Howard, welcome to Socrates in the City. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I really get sort of speechless or uh, unable to stop talking around you because we have so much in common and so much have you, you've written has influenced me so dramatically and so deeply. You are hard pressed to own up to that because you are um, overly humble, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try uh, to have a conversation with you um, about your life and about your writings, but principally, I want to talk to you about <clears throat> Chance or the Dance. Um, mm -hmm. Of your many great books, my favorite, it's a book that genuinely changed my life when I read it. I think I've told you that. I don't know if you have ever believed it, but I'm just going to keep saying it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm really... So excited to have the opportunity to talk to you in general, but specifically, uh, at least initially specifically, about Chance or the Dance. So, why don't I ask you the most basic question of all? Can you sum up the idea of Chance or the Dance? People say to me, what does that mean? And I yeah. tell them. But since yeah. you're here, I'd rather that you tell them. Yeah. Well, I suppose the title touches on you know an, an almost limitless topic, namely... Uh, is you know this scene that we're in, this universe, this world, how this this bit of history and so on? Um, is it did it all come about by mere chance? The, the whole drama of us being human and living in history and so forth. Uh, did it all come about by chance, or is it a exquisitely orchestrated uh, drama such as you might see in a, in a formal dance where the people who know how to dance, it looks uh, free and uh, liberating and exultant and so on, but uh, anybody who has ever tried to dance knows that uh, you can do a little bit of stumbling at first, but uh, it ends up looking like a mode of freedom, you know, and uh, I think that would give us a little clue as to how a, a Christian understands being human. I mean, are we, have we learned the steps of the dance? What are the steps of the dance? You uh, spoke at Socrates in the City right in the beginning of the whole thing, so maybe 2002, I think it was, at the, uh, the Metropolitan Club in, in New York City, and you spoke about Chance of the Dance, and I remember you saying uh, then and before that on, in, in a phone call that it all boils down to um, does the universe have meaning or not? But the way you put it really was does uh, the modern secularist version would say that everything happened by chance, therefore nothing means anything which is a horrifying concept. There's no meaning in the universe. Yeah. Or everything means everything, which is hard to, 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 to process. But you talk about the medieval Christian view versus the modern secular view. I love the fact that you do come from this kind of medieval 
approach. I mean, it's we're going to talk about C.S. Lewis at some point, but he was a medievalist. And But the idea that there was a time when everything meant everything, when you looked at the sun, it, it, it wasn't just a ball of gas and that kind of thing. T tell us a little bit about that, uh, where, where you got these ideas from. Well, I suppose, I mean, these ideas being, I suppose, the, the, the way I look at life, existence, the universe, being human. Right. Uh, and I suppose one, unless one is locked inside the, the rather uh, loosely put together modern view of, of being human and so forth, uh, one becomes impressed with the, increasingly with the, the, the mystery and the wonder uh, and the drama and even the exaltation of, of being human. You know, what is this scene we're in? And uh, did it all just happen higgledy-piggledy, uh, just th thrust together? Uh, or is it a, a, a splendidly orchestrated dance? Well, you, you, you make the case so well that the trouble in talking about this great book, Chance of the Dance, is that I never know if I want to talk about what it's about or how you say it, because your writing in it is so beautiful. And again, I don't want to embarrass you, although I do enjoy embarrassing you, but I don't want to embarrass you. But your writing, you, you love words, and it's why I love you, uh, and it's why I love your writing, because you rejoice in the words themselves, but it's always, you know, part of, of making a point. You're not just writing f free verse to impress people. You're making a point, but you love, you love words. So let, let me ask you this. Were you always like that when you were a kid? Did you love poetry? Did you love words? Because the words and the prose in Chance yes. of the Dance is, is literally unlike anything I've ever read. Well, I suppose so. Is that for as long as I can remember, uh, I, I have been intoxicated with words. Uh, I, I that, just that, that's a lot to say that. I just loved it. I mean, I can remember when I was very small and reading. It may have even been a child's version of John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress. Progress yeah. yeah, and I can remember. I think I uh, actually I can remember walking around saying, he getteth him a grievous crab tree cudgel. <laughs> and I was... He getteth uh, him, him... A grievous crab tree cudgel. A grievous I mean, where would you get a more toothsome cudgel. sentence than that? And for example, the word toothsome. Who yeah. uses that anymore? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, no. you uh, I feel like we should have a duck come down when you use the magic <laughs> word and you get 50 bucks. Um, when, when you say that, okay... Uh, I, 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 since we have time to cover everything, I, I want to go to your childhood. Your, your parents were extraordinary people, and your upbringing is, was an extraordinary upbringing. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, you are now a Roman Catholic. You were not raised that way. How were you raised in terms of faith and education? Hmm. Well, our, I'm the fifth of six children in, in the family that I grew up in, uh, and it was a very Christian household. Uh, where, where in the country? Uh, essentially Philadelphia. I mean, I actually was born in Philadelphia, and both of my parents were from there. And But then when I was very small, they moved to a suburb in New Jersey called Moorestown. And it was a lovely, oldie-worldy Quaker town. And I went to a Quaker school. We weren't Quakers ourselves, but we got used to the Quaker language. I mean, I, I grew up hearing the thee and thou. Uh, in daily walk, you know. I mean, and I would even, with my closest friend, I would speak the Quaker language uh, really? with my, my oldest friend. I mean, we would just naturally say, I'd say, Joe, how's thee this morning? Or what's thee been doing? Uh, what's and, thee been doing? Yeah. I, that's uh, that's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. What's we, thee you, you know Quakers yeah. don't speak that way anymore. At least Nixon did. What a pity. Did. Really, they don't. Uh, they, <laughs> but that's I didn't know that uh, about yeah, you. Yeah. I thought I knew all these things. Okay, uh, I, I want to hear, I guess, most people watching probably don't know that uh, you have a famous, at least one famous sibling. Can you tell us about Elizabeth Elliot? Yeah. Yes, uh, Betty, as we called her in the family, uh, 
is the, the second oldest of us six children. Uh, and it was interesting, she and I, uh, in this family of six offspring, uh, she and I had a very uh, intriguing, a very close relationship. We were, she was the second oldest and I was the second youngest, but there was something about the love of words and all sorts of things. I mean, she's, she's most famous for people who don't know for uh, her yeah. book, Gates of Splendor, yes. I guess is the title. Through Gates of Splendor. Through Gates of Splendor, about the, the, the murder of her husband. Yeah. Um, t tell us about that. Yeah. Well, she was married to uh, a chap named J Jim Elliott. They both went to Wheaton College together. As did you. Yes. Uh, and uh, he was one of uh, five young American men uh, who in 1956, I think it was, uh, they were in mission work in, Ecuador, in the Ecuadorian jungle, the Amazonian jungle, and they were trying to make uh, a contact, a friendly contact with a, a tribe there that are popularly called uh, the Alcas. The Alca they call Indians, themselves yeah. Wa Warani, yeah. but uh, they, most people know them as the Alcas. Right. And these five fellows um, made a... Uh, very carefully orchestrated and cautious uh, and hesitant attempt to make a friendly contact with them. And they uh, were afraid of all outsiders, uh, even other Indians. This was in the eastern jungle of Ecuador. And the, to make a long story short, they, uh, in their attempt to approach the, the Alca Indians, as they were called, they called themselves Warani, um, they were all speared to death. These fellows. These they were all killed. Yeah, all five of them. All five. I didn't. I didn't remember that. Yeah. And your brother-in-law was was one of those five, Jim yes. Elliot. Yes. Um, that's. You know, you don't hear very much about missionaries being killed these days. It's no. sort of like a 19th century British joke. Yeah. But yeah. in 19, as recently as 1956, this happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously remember it well. Yeah. Um, but your sister Elizabeth Elliot uh, wrote what has become a Christian classic through Gates of Splendor. It's yeah. a fam famous book. Um, were the were the rest of your siblings very serious about their faith, and, and where did your parents get their faith from? Yeah. Well, both of my parents were raised in Christian households where the Christian faith was very front and center, uh, and my father came from a literary line of uh, people. And uh, my mother's family, her father was a businessman in Philadelphia. Uh, and they, my father and mother, when they were the first five years of their marriage, they were in missionary work uh, in in Belgium. It, it wasn't jungles and the savages and so on. The first five years of your parents' marriage, yes. they were missionaries in Belgium. Yes. I've never heard that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and this is in the twenties. Yes, it would have been yeah. in the twenties. Yeah, so it was before I was born. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, they, my father was teaching in a Bible school in Brussels, and uh, they raised the first couple of kids of the six of us in the family. By the time I came along, uh, my father had been called back to the U.S. to become the editor of what was then kind of the flagship uh, journal of conservative Protestantism or evangelical Protestantism. It, the name of the journal, it, it's defunct now, but it was called the Sunday School Times. So before and, Christianity Today, yes. there was something called the Sunday School Times. Yes. I didn't remember that yeah. your father was, in fact, the, the editor. editor of that. That's, yes. a, that's a pretty big role in evangelicalism in America. Yes, I mean, given that metier, that uh, si situation, it was, you know, a prestigious uh, journal, and his yeah. position there, uh, you know, had a certain eclat to it. All and, right, you get another 50 bucks for using eclat. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, well, Thank you, Tom. Well, We're not going to be able right. to afford this. Yeah. Metier well, was, was close. But, but that, I didn't know this. Okay, so your, your family was 
very serious about its Christian faith. I mean, yeah. I sort of knew that, but yeah. I don't remember your your, your father's role. Um, when you were, let's say, uh, in high school, did yeah. you know that you were in love with language and that you wanted to be a writer and a teacher of literature? I, I don't know whether I would have defined it that way, but the, the truth of the matter was, it, indeed, I, I absolutely uh, was intoxicated with words and, and language. W were you, so you were thinking of being a writer, or I can't remember when you began corresponding with C.S. Lewis. Was that after college? Uh, goodness, I hardly remember. I, it, it must have been after I'd graduated from college. From Wheaton. Yeah. And, and your degree and, in Wheaton was, was English? Yes. Uh, what did you but, hope to do with an English degree? I have an English degree, and I know it's not, no, yeah, it's yeah, not easy there's, to... There's no job you can get with right, an English major. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think, well, it was partly because of the faculty, the chairman of the English department at the college where I went, Wheaton College in Illinois. Was that, was that Clyde Kilby? Kilby? Yes. Okay, forgive me. I ought to have mentioned it in the beginning. You right. dedicate this book, Chance of the Dance, to Clyde Kilby. Yes. So why why did you dedicate the book to him? Well, my goodness, he was he was my mentor, my intellectual mentor, uh, and was was the icon of a of a great and noble and profoundly civilized man and also exhibit A of what a Christian gentleman really is. You know, he was a Southerner from Mississippi, and, uh, you know, he could talk like a cracker, but uh, he was a profoundly, luminously uh, civilized man. Did you say luminously? Yes. Not numinously. Well, maybe numinously as well, but right. luminously as well. I figure with you, I might as well ask because it could be either. So, yeah. okay, so so he obviously was important to you. I ought to have known that since you yeah. dedicate the book to him. Yeah. Look, you've written so many wonderful books, um, mm -hmm. but as I say, the, to my mind, m most of what you say is summed up in, in, in Chance of the Dance. There's something about it that it points to everything else you've become, and you know, it, it seems, you wrote it, very, you were very young. How old were you, 32? It must have been somewhere along in there. I can't even remember. I don't, I don't, uh, don't yeah. know when I wrote it or how old I was. But I, I, I want to ask I you. I think you're correct. But I, 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 I want to ask you some, some uh, writerly questions. Did it take you long to write? No, I, I wrote almost as fast as I speak. Okay. I mean, I, it, I. I think it, this is when I when I uh, I have to say that I resent you deeply. I say. Yeah, deeply. <laughs> so you told me this once before, so yeah. I think I already knew you were going to say this. But I that's see. an amazing thing because the book seems almost like poetry. Uh, it's so beautifully written, so balanced and organized. But you have said that to me before that you have a facility for for writing that way. It's an amazing gift. Are you aware that it's a rare gift? Well, people have, have said so, but I, uh, you know, if, if you're the, the, the piece of merchandise yourself, you don't know what it's like being a dish rag. I mean, you, there, there you are. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, there you are. Here you are. Yeah. Um, that's, it's a big deal, though, because there's some, anybody who will read the book, and I hope everyone will read the book. Um, it's not required reading, by the way. You, oh, actually, it is. You didn't, you didn't realize <laughs> It's, it's now required reading, but it's, you know, it's short and it's glorious and it's lapidary and I think that now I get 50 bucks. Yeah, but it's yeah. basically, um, it's remarkable to hear you say that you wrote it almost effortlessly, that, that that's, that's the way you, you write. Uh, well, the first book I wrote was one called Christ the Tiger. Yeah, right. And Chance of the Dance was, a, was a, a convenient phrase or a handy phrase. I had been familiar with it. Uh, because it is a, a line from T.S. Eliot, okay. and in one of his poems, he says, was it chance or right. the dance? Did everything just get flung together? Right. Uh, or was it an exquisitely orchestrated dance? Right. The steps, I mean, what, what we're in here as human beings, this, this strange species we belong to, you know, we're not glow worms and we're not apes and, you know, we're not uh, peacocks. And so on. I think some people wish they were, or think they are, but there, there we are. So it, it was just a question of, uh, okay, 
wh what is this scene we mortals are in, we human mortals? Okay, but you, 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 um, you get a lot of what you say in it from the medieval view. So, of course, it yeah. makes me think of Lewis. We'll, we'll talk about Lewis uh, in a minute, but because I know you met him, and I want to hear about your time with C.S. Lewis uh, at his home in Oxford. But um, that medieval view, talk a little bit about that medieval view, the idea that it's a dance. There's something yeah. particularly medieval about that idea, because we think of a diff certain kind of dance. Yeah. We don't think, I think in the book you referred to the frog or the, uh, you know, you're, or the Watusi or the, you know, like, because oh. you wrote it in 1969. But the point is that when we think of dance today, it's a little bit different from when we think of medieval dance, which is orchestrated. And, and yeah. the whole book is filled with, with those ideas, the idea of the lion as a king. Actually, I, one of my favorite parts of the book that I can never get out of my head how do you pronounce the dog, uh, the Knopf dog, Borzoi? Albert Knopf, Borzoi. Borzoi. Yeah. So there's a chapter, I think it's called, of Dishrags and Borzoi. Yeah. And you talk about seeing a Borzoi in Washington Square Park. You lived oh, yeah. in New York City. Right. I will never get that out of my mind. Can, can you talk about that? What the, what the, the Borzoi? Borzoi represented? Oh. Well, if, if you've ever seen it, it's a, like an, an Afghan hound or a Russian wolfhound, you know. I mean, it's a large, uh, slender dog. And you realize you, you can't just chuck a borzoi under the chin. I mean, there's something awesome about a borzoi, or most people know it as a Russian wolfhound or an Afghan hound. There's something, something regal. Regal, that's a, a perfect word. I probably uh, got it from your book. Yeah, well. Princely. Who, I had never thought of that before, that, that, you know, you're making the case that this is not incidental, no. that this dog has this princely uh, mean or gait, it, that there's something about that dog that, that points to the idea yeah. of uh, uh, royalty. Yes. You know, it's not incidental. It's yeah. not just a quirk. Uh, it's not a random mutation no. that led to it looking like this. No. And you, you make the point that that matters. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was made uh, that way. To, and uh, you use the word regal. There is something regal uh, about a borzoi. You realize, you feel as though there's a, there's a certain mystery or solemnity about, you know, he, he's not a He's not a little, little puppy waggling his tail, this kind of thing. You feel as though he's, uh, you know, he's in control here or something, this, this, this Borzoi. I mean, they're awesome dogs, you know, and that word has become ruined now. You know, it's awesome, man. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, but he's really, they really are awesome. They seem to float along. Uh, what is particularly striking is once you acknowledge that, or once the reader acknowledges it, you say, yes, yes, that's true, that's true. But then you go on to say, God intended this, that in creation, yeah. he has given us parts of himself and different images and things. It's not random. No. Um, uh, I think you talk, I don't know if you talk about hyenas skulking around, or I. sometimes I so, yeah. these things are my glosses on something I've read, but, you know, in explaining your book, I, yeah. I say, look at the, look at a hyena. Why is a hyena, yeah. why would we say skulking? And why do we imply that that's pejorative? Why do we, why is that pejorative to yeah. skulk, whereas yeah. to float, you know, across the Russian steppe like a borzoi is somehow beautiful yeah. and positive? I mean, you, yeah. I've never thought about any of that until I read your book. Well, it's, I suppose it's a, it's a way of thinking, isn't it? Uh, yes. A way of looking at existence, life, the whole show, as yeah. C.S. Lewis called it. Uh, you know, what, <clears throat> I mean, what is a, what is a borzoi? A, as opposed to a little wiggly-waggly dachshund or something, whom, whom I like very much, right. I mean, dachshunds. Uh, I mean, they have their own regality. But uh, I, I think to... to to be a Christian in one sense, it, it's, you, you've got the whole drama, the whole cast of characters mm -hmm. arrayed before you in, in, in being human and living life on this earth and so on. Um, you, you, you've got cues and clues to the nature of the dance, which was the old word that they used to use, meaning what, what C.S. Lewis calls the, the, the whole show. 
you know, it's, it's I've never orchestrated. Heard, now you said that twice now. I've never heard that Lewis calls the cosmos, the great dance, the, yeah. the whole show. The whole show. Is, that's I a guess phrase I'd, he I'd uses. say the whole it. shebang. But he, yeah, well, so he, yes. uh, I, I, well, inevitably we get to Lewis because I can't help, th mm -hmm. when, I, when I think of you, I think of Lewis because I, I feel like you're a, uh, you're. That's a very long leap. You're, <laughs> yeah, t typically, uh, typical of Tom Howard to, to, to speak a lie. Like that, you. Uh, it's a. It's an extremely short leap. You're practically connected at the hip. You're almost Siamese, literally speaking. You. Uh, your book reminds me so much of Lewis. It's very different, but it comes right out of his worldview. So it's hard for me to divorce Chance or the Dance from Lewis's oeuvre because, I, I guess maybe this is the time to ask you, was it his writing and your studying under Clyde Kilby at Wheaton that, that helped you to begin to see this view of the universe? Oh, I think there's no question. There's, there's no question that, I guess, my, my outlook, my Weltanschauung, my world and life view, was profoundly shaped by my parents and the house I only grew up in. And next to my parents, I guess it would be C.S. Lewis's work. Uh, I went to see him one time, and he himself was sort of the, the living icon of what you see in his works. What did it feel like to yeah. meet the man who had written these yeah. books that had so affected you? Yeah. Well, we had correspond. I mean, I wrote him out of the blue. I didn't just want to land at his front door. Sure. So I wrote, would it be okay if I just popped in for a little bit uh, some afternoon? And, you know, he acted as though, well, what could be nicer, you know, come by all means, you know, come up, blah, blah, blah. Here's the train you take and you walk up to my house at the kilns. And so I did. And we went in, you know, he came to the door and the first thing he said was, Mr. Howard, you know, and uh, we were off and running. It, it wasn't a long conversation. Or, um, maybe, I don't know whether it was three quarters of an hour or something or less, but I, because I didn't want to, you know, presume on his time, for heaven's sakes. I'll and bet you he enjoyed talking to you, but that's well, another story. Well, that's, that's, that's an assumption. That's did a presumption. He look, did he look healthy? He only lived two years more after yeah, that. Yeah, right. No, he did. He, he had a rubicund face and uh, hearty and somewhat tubby. Uh, and uh, no, he looked perfectly fine. Yeah. But it wasn't too long after that that he died. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he just took me into a little whatever the room was, whether yeah. it was a study or a little it's side It's the little part. study. It's still there. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing, but they've gotten rid of the smoke stains and the blackout <laughs> curtains from World War II. Do you remember uh, any books from your childhood? You mentioned being very, very young and reading uh, John Bunyan's... Uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's yeah. Progress. Do, do you remember other books? Because whenever I read your stuff, and Chance of the Dance is filled with you know, these uh, oblique references to nursery rhymes and things. D did your parents yeah. read to you? Oh, you yes. Yeah, both both our father and our mother read to us probably every evening before they put us together. There were six of us children. Yeah. So, but that was the usual pattern when it was time for one to go to bed. Uh, you know, we would go upstairs and wash and get into our pajamas. Uh, and then, you know, at different points in the evening, according to our age, uh, and then one, either our father or our mother would, would read to us from some good book back, back then. There's a, there's a line in Chance of the Dance, which I think I quote in the new foreword that I've been privileged to write, um, mm. but about something, I think you write, don't expect to find cosmic order in goosey goosey gander, or something like that, yeah. and another place you refer to wee willy winky, and you're 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 <laughs> you pepper your writing with you know quotations from the most um, sophisticated, elegant sources mixed in with with that kind of like stuff, like wee willy winky, like wee willy winky, and I think that's why I find your writing so delightful uh, because you cl you're clearly having fun thinking about these things. I don't know if you're conscious really? of that or if that's just what you do. Well, I don't think it's a question of so much of my saying, oh, hey, I'm sitting here having fun. The point was I was sitting there having fun, not thinking about sitting there and having fun. You're, 
Yeah. So what is that? Are you looking along the sunbeam or anyway? Yes, that's probably looking. something like that. Right. But yeah, there was nothing I liked better than than reading something, mm. something enchanting. I mean. Right. Yeah. The Assyrian. What is the line? The, the Assyrian. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. That first two lines of a line by, oh good gracious, is yeah, it Wordsworth or Shelley? Uh, uh, yeah. I think it's Wordsworth. Could the be. Assyri- say it again. The Assyrian. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. Like I can, I have that, to look back and that try lights the rest some of it. people up. I mean, that lights me yeah. up. It lights you yeah, up, boy, and I'm yeah. assuming most of the people listening to this book. But I mean, you quote things like that in *Chance of the Dance*, and it it makes one want to read. You know, it makes me want to yeah. look up those poems yeah. and, and things like yeah. that. But you're, I mean, I know you taught prep school for many, many years, and I imagine I think of you as sort of the ideal professor or teacher because you're filled with these things. You you don't have to prepare a lesson plan in, in a sense that you're, you're, yeah. it just comes out of you. But I guess, as you said, that when you were little, this was already something you were intoxicated, as you said, with words. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would, at that age, or this age still, you know, I would rather read than do almost anything else. And uh, I can remember, was it th- uh, third or fourth grade or something, and the teacher in the early afternoon gave us a, a choice of the class you know, shall, shall, shall I read a story to you, or would you like to, it was something like cut out Valentine's or something. <laughs> and the whole class, Valentine's, Valentine's, and I was the only one saying, no, let's have a story. Right, you were, you were the bad kid, obviously. Yeah, right. Um, have, you, you've not written fiction, though. No. Have you ever aspired to write fiction? Not seriously, because it, it might be because I have maybe... A few times I thought that I might try my hand at a story, and I can't write a story. I have great difficulty writing, you know, coming up with plots. So I really? steal plots. For example, mm-hmm. you know, a biography of someone's life, the plot yeah. is already there. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but your prose is so beautiful that it, it, suggests, it's, it suggests to me that you would have written poetry or, or fiction. Yeah. Have you written poetry? can't write a half line of poetry. I don't believe you. I don't no. believe you, but well, we'll, we'll have to. I'll have to be respectful <laughs> as the host. Okay, at some point I knew that I would have to bring up the title of one of the chapters of Chance or the Dance. It's a shocking three-letter word. It begins with an S. I know there's an E someplace in it, and it ends with an X. I can't remember the exact word. But in this chapter, you do something so beautiful. You talk about, you know, Sex. I would say the divine, how did you know? You see, this is your word, man. The, the, the divine view of this thing that we today call sex, about God's idea. And it's so beautiful to me that you, that you do that. It comes out of, you know, everything else. Everything is connected to it. But Writing that in 1969 was a pretty dramatic departure from, you know, the cultural norm. Sex is an oddity, uh, in in a way. I mean, great Scott, dogs do this, you know, you're, turtles you're, do this. You're I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I'll for take, real. I'll take your word for it. I've tried to look away whenever turtles well, lean in that direction. I'm basically a mid-Victorian, and I avert my eyes when anything is going on dogs or whatever. But so it's so, an oddity, you say. And it is an oddity. It. Yes, because if you think, I mean, if you think of us with our intellect, you know, our luminescent intellect uh, and so forth, you know, what a, what a crummy and humiliating drama that is. You know, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, and, you know, it's not so particularly cerebral and so on. We like to think of ourselves as dignified an intellect and, yeah you know this is and, and yeah, yeah but you point, point but, but you talk about how it's a picture of you know mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if you say this literally but you know you're getting to the idea that it's a picture of uh, uh, Christ being united in in marriage with his, with his bride it's this yeah. glorious yeah. Uh, eternal image yeah. and we become bearers of that image. Yeah. And you don't you don't hear people talk about that very much these yeah. days. Yeah. 
Well, you just said it very well. I mean, that's that, that's uh, the problem. I've read your crazy. book so many times that I maybe I know it as well as <laughs> yeah. you do. Uh, I, I just, uh, but it's remarkable, Tom, because I didn't know this until I read your book. I wasn't able to articulate these things. I've hmm. never read them uh, really before or since in the way that you put them in the book, and hmm. I think that. Uh, it's just a gift. I mean, it's just a, it's a wonderful mm-hmm. gift to the people who, who read the book. And I, I know that um, Ignatius Press, uh, you know, publishes it. It's, such a, it's so beautiful. All their books are so beautiful. Hmm. They do a good job hmm. with Chesterton and Howard and, and others. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that array. Of, right, that, 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 array, that array. But uh, how many books, do you remember how many books you've written? No, I haven't any idea, but it's not because I've written dozens and dozens and have never counted them. I, I, I don't think it's more than five. I don't. Is, See, it, only is you, any? only you would be so self-abnegating hmm. as to not remember the number. But you, you kill me. You crack me up. I, I, I can say that you've written more than more than that. I know. Maybe the archivist in the back of the room has an idea. Yeah. Hmm. She's holding up eight or nine fingers. And you've written, but you've written innumerable no, essays. Any you, have, you have written so many essays in so many publications over the years. Are, are they collected? Does anybody mean to collect them? Does uh, your daughter, Galley? So. Uh, My wife is nodding yes. Yes? What? Well, Ignatius put out um, The Night is Far Spent. Ah, That's thank you. Collection. Thank oh, you. Oh, there we are. Aren't we glad your wife has, has been part of the audience today? Yeah. The, 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 uh, thank you, Loveless. No, that, that really, um, th- that's right. The, the Night is Far Spent. You, you wrote a, a, a tremendous book uh, called On Being Catholic. And uh, even the cover is gorgeous. I think it's Giotto. Um, you know, when you yeah. look at the gold and the blue, you have to assume Giotto. Giotto, yeah. But uh, you, you wrote a book on being Catholic. Uh, Catholic in our second hour, not now. But I want to yeah. talk to you about your migration from fundamentalism uh, to Romanism, or or what can we call it? Uh, to to Catholicism. Uh, to Catholicism, uh, the as, ancient church, as it were. Yes, one of the two lungs of what we call the ancient church. Um, I want I want to talk to you about that in the in the second hour. Um, I guess, but that's another tremendous book. You've you've written. Um, a number of, if if I can say it with you sitting here, a number of important books that help frame the way people um, can think about things. As I say, to my mind, Chance of the Dance is, is absolutely at the top of the list, and it, fr- it, fra- it has framed the way I think about reality. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I know you weren't aware when you were writing it that the, it would have this effect on people, but it, it's hmm. done that for me. So hmm. on behalf of all of those who've read it, and on behalf of uh, all of those who will read it, now that I've told them it's it's required reading, and, and it is legally, I hate just hate to be the bearer of, of that kind of news, but legally uh, you do have to read it. Um, if you want to get into heaven, if, if you want if you want to get into heaven or or into polite society, yeah. um, I think uh, that on behalf of um, all the people who will read it. Um, after having watched this, I, I just want to thank you because you cannot imagine the effect that it's had on so many lives. And I even think of, of the effect that it's had on me and how it's affected people that I've affected because, hmm. because I read it. So it's just hmm. a funny thing. I know you didn't think of it when you were writing it. You just were sitting mm-hmm. down and just writing did you it. type or write longhand? There's a, there's a... Uh, I type. You type because it's much faster than. Uh, long. I mean, it's it's it's, it's, you, it's painful to me to write. Uh, do you type longhand. legibly? How else can that's you type? A, that's a trick question. Oh, well, I so. wanted to end on a on a really menial, uh, unimportant note, and I mm-hmm. think I've succeeded. Uh, you would Tom have been Howard, happy. my friend. I love you. I thank you. We'll continue the conversation, but that's it for now. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you. Thank you, Eric. Good heavens. Mm-hmm.